Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Today we have a pretty interesting review. We're gonna take a look at the new Razer Edge. And when you see this, you might think to yourself, well, that looks a lot like a phone with like a Razer Kishi attached to it. And honestly, you wouldn't be wrong because that's basically what this is. We have a tablet that's been made by Razer specifically for the new Razer Kishi V2. And there are some slight differences between this controller and the one that you can just buy on Amazon for like $100. For example, this one has a headphone jack and it has some linear haptics, which are actually really nice. Now, there's been a little bit of controversy when it comes to the rollout of this device, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. But I do want to say that for this review specifically, we're mostly just going to take a look at the hardware itself and see whether or not it's going to be worth the asking price. Because after all, this is not a cheap handheld. This is $400 starting price, and it can go up from there if you want 5G connectivity. Activity. And I think that $400 price is pretty significant considering the fact that that's the same price as the base model of the Steam Deck. And so what I want to do in this video here is differentiate the two, talk about what it's like to use an Android-based handheld like this, but then also some of the benefits of getting an x86 handheld like the Steam Deck. Because at the end of the day, I don't think they're a direct comparison. It's different architectures and they play different style of games. And so it's really going to be up to what type of games you want to actually play. And I gotta say, the Razer Edge is a really interesting device because for the price, you're actually getting a lot of really good hardware. It's just a matter of whether or not at that specific $400 price, you're better invested in putting your money somewhere else. And so that's what we're gonna talk about here in this video. We'll talk about what it's like to own and use a Razer Edge and whether or not it's a good fit for you and your use case. And so without any further delay, let's jump into it. All right, let's get started with the specs. Now this one is running the new Snapdragon G3X Gen 1. And this is a new chipset made by Qualcomm specifically for gaming. Now I'm not an expert when it comes to smartphone chipsets, but my understanding here is that this is basically the equivalent of a Snapdragon 888, and it's also using the same base Adreno 660 GPU. But the main distinction here is that the G3X has been overclocked because it has an active cooling fan. And so as a result, Razer says you should get about 30% improved performance over the Snapdragon 888, and you should get more consistent gameplay as well thanks to that internal cooling. Now for my part, I didn't do a lot of benchmarking. Number one, I don't really understand what those numbers mean anyway. But then for me as a consumer, as well as a viewer, I'm more interested in seeing what the actual performance is going to be like. And so that's what we're going to focus on here in this video. Anyway, that's enough about the chipset. Let's move on to the other specs. And next is the screen. The Edge has a 6.8 inch AMOLED screen with a resolution of 2400 by 1080. This means it has a 20 by 9 aspect ratio, which is going to be fairly wide. It's the same size as most modern smartphones today. Additionally, this has a refresh rate of up to 144 hertz, which can be helpful with Android gaming. Now we're going to be reviewing the Wi-Fi model here today, which comes with six gigabytes of RAM. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. Next, we have 128 gigs of internal storage, and this one also comes with a micro SD card slot. And you'll be able to use cards up to two terabytes in size, but bear in mind that right now, based on the limitations of the software, the file system has to be FAT32. What this means is as of this review right here, you cannot use any files that are larger than four gigabytes on that card. And that is going to come into play with some of the larger PS2, Nintendo Wii, and Nintendo Switch games if you want to put them on your card. A couple other things worth mentioning, this one has a 5000 milliamp hour battery. That's about a moderate size when it comes to batteries. And I found that I get anywhere between 6 and 10 hours of battery life depending on the intensity of the game I'm playing. Finally, this has the latest in wireless connectivity, so we have Wi-Fi 6E as well as Bluetooth 5.2. That means we'll have a very nice stable connection when it comes to Wi-Fi for streaming and then also Bluetooth for headphones or an extra controller. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of the video that there was some controversy related to the rollout of the Razer Edge, and so I wanted to take a moment here just to address that before we moved on. One thing I've learned from just observing the internet over the past couple of years is that anytime you talk about hardware related to the Razer company, the company itself kind of comes into the conversation as well, because they have a bit of a bad reputation when it comes to customer service and things like that over the years. And unfortunately, I would say the rollout of the Razer Edge did not do them any favors, and it all comes down to the their announcement and launch itself. Basically, when they first announced it last year, there were going to be two different models, a Wi-Fi model and a 5G model. And as you can expect, the 5G model is going to have a 5G antenna inside, and if you pair it with a Verizon contract, you could then use it out in town instead of just within Wi-Fi. But looking at the initial spec sheet, there was no real difference between the two either. They had the same amount of specs, and the price difference between the 5G and the Wi-Fi one was pretty significant. And so, for all intents and purposes, unless 5G was very important to you and worth an additional $200, it made a lot more sense to get the $400 Wi-Fi model instead. 
But unfortunately, this is where it gets tricky because a couple days before the actual launch of the Razer Edge itself, they quietly changed the spec sheet on their page to drop the amount of RAM on the Wi-Fi model from eight gigabytes down to six. And as you can imagine, many people are upset about this and said that Razer was doing a bait and switch and basically saying that they were gonna get a certain amount of specs, but then after they put their money down, they were gonna get less. Okay, I'm gonna cut in here from my desk. I just wanted to read my email really quick before I said specifically what they had said in the email. I got two different emails from them. The first one said it was an update to my order and that there was a mistake on the website and the Wi-Fi model was always gonna be six gigabytes. It was just an error on their website. And that is what it is. And some other people got a email and I saw this on Reddit, but basically that email said that here's an additional $25 gift card for a future purchase. I didn't get that email. I'm not sure if that was because my pre-order came a little bit later than others, but instead what I got is an email saying that my shipment was gonna be delayed and that I got a $20 gift card for that. Again, for a future purchase. Now for me, this strikes me as a little bit weird just for the fact that if a company messes up like this, you probably aren't gonna to wanna to buy another device or product from them. And so why would they offer you a discount on a future purchase? If anything, I would have liked to have seen some sort of refund, maybe even that $25 is just kind of a gesture of goodwill. But the way I see it, it's kind of an empty gesture to say it's gonna be working on a future purchase. After all, that means that they expect you to still trust the company after they've done this kind of change right there at the last minute. So you can take that for what it's worth, but that's kind of how I read into it. Now, at the end of the day, I don't wanna spend a lot of time harping on this whole issue because I don't think that the two gigabytes of difference when it comes to the RAM here makes a huge amount of difference, but I just didn't really like the way that Razer did that, and so I wanted to address that here in the beginning before we move forward. And we're actually gonna do some testing between the Wi-Fi model that I have here, as well as a 5G model that my friend Stubbs over at Retro Handhelds has. And so we'll see whether or not that 25% difference in RAM actually comes through when it comes to actually playing a game. And so for the rest of the video here, I'm basically just gonna treat this device as it is right now. And so the Wi-Fi model does have six gigabytes of RAM, and we're just gonna move on from there and see how the performance is, at least with the specs right here. In the end, yes, I agree that Razer probably could have done a better job when it came to this rollout, and it was kind of a blunder on their part. But all the same, this is what we have to work with, and so let's actually check out how it performs from here. Okay, let's move on to the unboxing next. Inside you'll find the tablet and then underneath that will be a quick start guide. It'll just show you things like what the buttons do and how to install the tablet to the controller itself. Underneath that you'll find the controller as well as a USB-C charging cable. So let's go ahead and take a close look at the controller itself. And we'll start with the joysticks. These are relatively small and remind me a lot of what you would find on a Nintendo Switch Joy-Con. And they have the same general feel as that, and they also do click down for L3 and R3. And on the left side below that, we have the D-pad. This is a dome switch style connection, which means they're gonna be very clicky. But luckily the D-pad as well as the section around it are both rounded, which makes it very comfortable to use. It definitely has a clicky feel to it, but at the same time, it's also very precise. If anything, I would say it reminds me a bit of the D-pad that you can find on an Xbox One controller. And we'll test this with some gameplay here later in the video. Also on the left, we have a function button here that behaves like a select button. And then near the bottom, we have a capture or screenshot button. And these buttons also have a very clicky feel to them. Next, we're gonna move over to the face buttons. Now these have a switch style connection to them and they actually feel very nice. They're a little bit clicky, but have a very light feel to them. And so because of that, they actually feel very nice to press down on. Additionally, you can press down on them very quickly, and so these feel like very premium face buttons. The two function buttons near the bottom are gonna be a Nexus button, we'll talk about that in a second, and then also a Start button. Now let's take a look at the top of the controller. We're gonna start with the triggers today. These have an analog input to them and are very light on the fingers as well. In terms of shape and size, they remind me of a PS4's triggers, but they're also much lighter on the fingers. And so in addition to having an analog input, I also feel like I can press down on these very quickly. I think the amount of travel and resistance here is very good. The shoulder buttons also feel very good. They have that same kind of light switch mechanism to them as the face buttons. And yeah, they're very easy to press down on as well. And same goes with the M1 and M2 buttons. These are programmable buttons within the software to replicate any of the other buttons on the controller. For me personally, I just map them to L3 and R3 and use them as hotkeys. Now the back of the controller has these nice textured grips which feel really good in the hand. And you can also see within the attachment mechanism that there's a little bit of a slope right here on each side. And that is to accommodate the rounded back of the edge tablet itself. 
Other than that, I think that's really about it when it comes to the controller. It has a nice feel in terms of the plastic, it doesn't get too smudgy, and feels pretty solid overall. Oh, and of course, who could forget the I.O. on the bottom? So we have a headphone jack here on the left, and then a USB-C pass-through charging port here on the right. So that's the controller, now let's take a look at the tablet. Now the first thing that caught my eyes are the rounded bezels around each of the edges. And this looks a lot like a smartphone in that regard, and it'll be even more stark when we actually turn it on. As I mentioned, there's a bit of roundedness to the back of the tablet, and the speakers are located on each of the two sides. On the back, we have two fan vents. The one on the top is for exhaust, and the bottom one is intake. And then of course, a subdued Razer logo here on the back. Up top we have two volume buttons, and then a sleep or power button, and then also a microphone input. I didn't get any footage of it, but on the bottom we have a similar microphone input as well as a micro SD card slot. And finally on the right side we also have a USB-C port. And so turning on the tablet here, the setup process is going to be very similar to any other Android phone or tablet. And I'm not going to bore you with that whole setup, but once it's done you'll get this Android interface here. And really this device is running a vanilla version of Android 12, and I kind of like that. It's like having a blank slate. On other devices like the Logitech Cloud, it has its own tablet interface, which is kind of hard to navigate. And so now let's take another look at the bezels and overall size. And as you can see, it looks a lot like a smartphone. After all, this is the Red Magic 7 right here, and it has the exact same size and dimensions in terms of the screen. And so really, for all intents and purposes, Razer made a specialized tablet right here that looks a lot like a phone, but just doesn't have a lot of phone functions. In fact, I could actually just take my Red Magic 7 like this and plug it directly into the Razer Kishi. Now, one of my main complaints about using a telescopic controller with a phone is that this setup usually will have a little bit of wobble to it. And as you can see, using the Red Magic 7 right here, it does have a little bit of give. So now let's try this exact same setup, but with the Razer Edge. First and foremost, you can see it just looks a lot better when it's connected like this. And yeah, I would say the amount of wiggle here between the two is about 50% reduced here on the edge, but it's definitely still there. And so if you're looking for something with a very sturdy feel to it, I would say that the Razer Edge is not going to be a good fit. And so overall, when it comes to just the look and feel of the Razer Edge, I think it does feel pretty good in the hands, but I also feel it requires a bit of a lighter touch compared to something that is a dedicated handheld. And a lot of that has to do with this telescopic connection here on the back. In terms of just overall comfort, I think it's very easy to access all of the buttons, but does get a little bit tight when you're trying to access the function buttons as well. When it comes to accessing the triggers and shoulders and function buttons here, I actually think these are very comfortable. And so in general, I have no complaints when it comes to the combination of using the analog sticks as well as the trigger and shoulder buttons. All of this is perfectly ergonomic. I would say the only thing that's uncomfortable about this setup is that large connection here with the telescopic controller. It doesn't feel nice to put your fingers on it, and so instead I found that I spread my fingers between the middle and the ring finger to avoid it. And while this isn't the most uncomfortable grip around, it's still a little bit wider than I would naturally hold it. And so this was an element of the overall grip that I did find a little bit annoying. Now when it comes to actually holding the device and having it sit in your hands, it is very comfortable over long term use. A lot of that has to do with the fact that the rounded edges here at the bottom just cup directly into your hands and feel very nice. And so overall, I would say that yes, the Razer Edge is ergonomically comfortable, but I do think it's going to be less comfortable in larger hands, and I also think it requires a lighter touch, just on the fact that the Edge is not made out of one single part. Now when it comes to overall feel of the D-pad when actually playing a game, I would say this is very comfortable too. For platforming games like Celeste, where precision inputs are important, I feel like the clickiness of the D-pad actually really helps in this regard. And so I would say this is definitely a D-pad I could play something like Celeste or Super Meat Boy on. Now when it comes to fighting games, I had mixed results. Personally, I learned how to play Street Fighter 2 while playing it on an SNES gamepad, and so because of that I prefer a mushy rubber membrane connection. And since the Razer Edge uses a D-pad with dome switch connections, it's much more clicky and a little bit off-putting for me. However, I found with a bit of practice and really focusing on the outside of the circle, I was able to throw Hadoukens and Shoryukens. However, even after practicing it for a couple days, I still found that I was missing the inputs very often. I would say that I can throw the fireball about three quarters of the time, but about half the time I could not get the dragon punch to work. And so honestly, I did find this a little bit frustrating when it came to playing fighting games. Now if you are a fighting games enthusiast, you probably know whether or not you prefer a clicky or a mushy d-pad, and so you probably got enough information from this to know if you'd like it. Either way for me, I found that everything but fighting games worked well with the d-pad. Okay, now let's talk about this screen for a bit. Like I mentioned before, this has a 20 by 9 aspect ratio. 
Now, thankfully, many modern Android games will actually scale to that ratio, and so something like Horizon Chase Turbo will look very good on this screen, because essentially this is the same as if you were playing it on an Android phone. And so when it comes to native Android games that support 20 by 9, yeah, it looks really good here, other than those rounded corners, but again, that's kind of a norm when it comes to smartphones nowadays. Now, when it comes to actually playing games, and that could be anything from emulating to streaming, I think the more common aspect ratio would be 16 by 9. After all, modern gaming systems from the Xbox 360 era and beyond have all been in 16x9. Additionally, if you're going to try to stream something from Xbox Game Pass or from your PlayStation Remote Play, it's all going to be in 16x9 as well. And so personally, I would have preferred to have a 16x9 display on this device overall. For me personally, I do not intend on focusing on Android games with this device, and so for me, 16x9 would have been the better fit. Another thing worth mentioning is that due to the 20 by 9 aspect ratio, the size of the screen, which is 6.8 inches, is actually going to feel a lot smaller than you may think. Here's a quick comparison between the Razer Edge and the Nintendo Switch OLED edition. As you can see, the Switch has a much larger screen, even though it's only 7 inches, so 0.2 inches larger. But when you try to play 16x9 content like Sonic Mania right here, you can see that it just looks a lot more impressive on a native 16x9 display. And so in comparison to the 7 inches you get on the Switch, you only get about 5.5, maybe 5 and 3 quarters on the Razer Edge. And that's a lot bigger of a difference than the 0.2 inches that these screen sizes themselves may lead you to believe. Here's another example right here. The Steam Deck is a 7 inch display as well, but this one has a 16 by 10 screen, which means it's going to be even taller. And so as a result, the screen itself is larger overall. Even when playing 16 by 9 content like Sonic Mania, it's still much bigger than the Razer Edge, and it's even a little bit larger than the Switch OLED as well. Another factor here is that if you use a smaller device that has a 16x9 display, the screen sizes are going to be pretty similar. And so for example, let's take a look at the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. This one's a relatively small device, as you can see it has a 4.7 inch screen. But the thing is, even though the RP3 Plus is much smaller than the Razer Edge, the screen size is not that different. When looking at 16x9 content, which I think will be the majority of your game time with the Razer Edge, you can see there's only a 1 inch difference between the two. And so in my opinion, I would say the Razer Edge would have been a much better device if it had had a native 16x9 display. Another consequence of using a wide display like this is that 4x3 systems like the NES just look disproportionately small. Again, if we compare that to the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, you can see we get about 4 inches with 4x3 content on the RP3 Plus, and that's only going to be about 4.5 inches on the Razer Edge. And so again, we have a device that's much larger, but then also only has a slightly larger screen. And unfortunately, I think that's just kind of a big waste. On the other end of the spectrum, you can see that the Steam Deck gets about six and a quarter inches altogether with 4x3 content. And so again, I just feel like the Razer Edge is not a good fit for 4x3 games. Now, if you do want to focus on classic gaming with your Razer Edge, there are some workarounds. For example, within RetroArch, there is the Genesis Plus GX Wide Core. This will allow you to expand the sides of many Genesis games to make them in a 16x9 aspect ratio. And so, depending on the game you play, you may actually have a very good experience like this. On Super Nintendo, it's a little bit trickier. You have to individually patch your games, and personally, I've only actually done that for Super Mario World. But there are other games that can be patched for widescreen, for example, Super Mario Kart, Pilot Wings, as well as Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. Additionally, I found that the native 3x2 aspect ratio of the Game Boy Advance is also very nice on this screen. This one's a little bit wider than 4x3, and so because of that, it does look nicer. Now, one added benefit of having a widescreen like this is that for Nintendo DS and 3DS, you can show both screens at once, and they both will look pretty big. And so here with Mario Kart DS, I can see both screens at the same time, but I've also set it up with hotkeys using the M buttons to be able to toggle between the screens if I only want to see one at a time. And so I would say for those two systems, yeah, this is actually pretty nice to have a wider screen. And so my main conclusion here when it comes to aspect ratio is that I think that 16 by 9 is the most fitting ratio when it comes to playing games on the Razer Edge. You're still going to have black bars on the sides, and it's a little bit of wasted opportunity when it comes to screen space. But I would say if you're considering the Razer Edge, I would think about what type of game you're playing and whether or not it's going to be a good fit for the aspect ratio here. If you plan on doing streaming or Android games, or playing games that are naturally in 16x9 or can be used in widescreen, then yeah, that might be a good fit. However, if you planned on playing 4x3 content, something like Super Nintendo or the other classics, you may not have a good time. For me personally, I don't really plan on playing any 4x3 systems on this device at all. 
Okay, now let's talk a little bit about screen quality. To start, the colors and vibrancy are very nice on this display. Additionally, I was surprised to find how bright it actually got. In fact, for most of my footage, I'm actually filming it at 50% brightness because it is too bright at the highest one. But that'll be really great if you want to try to play it outdoors. The other thing that surprised me about this display is that it got surprisingly dark. In fact, this is a very wide dynamic range when it comes to a screen. And so I think this device is going to be equally good playing it in bed at night, as well as playing it outdoors or in the car during the day, something like that. Either way, I'm a big fan of this screen overall. I love the richness of the colors, and I also like the wide dynamic range when it comes to the brightness as well. Next, let's take a quick audio test. And I don't know about you, but I was very impressed by the sound quality here. Even though the speakers are facing sideways, I think the wedge setup underneath them really pushes the sound straight out. And so because of this, this has some of the best sound quality I've heard in a handheld hands down. All right, so now that we've talked about the screen and the sound, let's actually talk about the software experience. Like I mentioned, you know, this is an Android 12 interface, so it's very similar to using a phone. There's a couple built-in apps. For example, there's this one here, which has a bunch of ads for game rewards and things like that. To be honest, I opened this up and decided I would never open it up again. But if you are into this kind of stuff, you can totally do it. Now, one app I did find useful is the Nexus app, which is built in here. This will give you quick access to your Android games, but with the new firmware update, it also allows you to turn on a virtual controller for certain games. This is going to be great for button mapping certain games that don't have native controller support. And I'll show you that here when we get to that section of the video. However, as you can imagine for me personally, I'm using an Android front end to be able to access all of my emulated games. And so as usual, I'm going to be using the Daijisho front end, and I've made a dedicated video about this. So I'll leave it linked in the video description below. But essentially, this allows me to tab through all of my different emulated systems and then launch my games directly from here. And so this is where I'm actually spending most of my time when I'm navigating through the system. I love the ability to jump in and out of my games as if this was a gaming console. For me personally, I think the fewer times that I need to swipe or go in between emulators, the better. And really, you're not losing a lot by using it too, because there is an apps tab, so you can access all of your other apps right here as well. And that's going to include the Nexus app in case I need to launch an Android game with the key mapping support enabled. And finally, the other two things I wanted to show you about the software is that within the settings, there are a couple things that are important. Number one, within the battery section, there's the ability to turn on performance mode. This will give you the benefit of added performance, but at the expense of a faster fan speed and then also some lower battery life. The other thing you may be going to often in these settings is going to be under display and then refresh rate. Here you can toggle between 60 and 144 hertz. For me personally, I mostly just use it in 60 hertz, but when playing Android games, I did bump it up in case I get a higher frame rate. And so let's go ahead and move over to Android games now. I'm going to play everything at 144 hertz and see what kind of performance you can get. And so when it comes to the more standard or lightweight Android games, things like Vampire Survivors or Streets of Rage 4, these are all going to play just fine, absolutely no problem here. You can even play the games that are more challenging, like Diablo Immortal. Even on the highest settings, it'll still run very smoothly. And so if you are looking specifically for something to play Android games, this is actually very impressive. For example, even with the highest settings on Diablo Immortal, you can see that my GPU load here in CPU float is only about 79%. And while we're here, let's go ahead and get a listen to the fan noise. And I'd say that the fan noise here is pretty darn quiet, especially compared to something like the Steam Deck or another handheld PC. Now let's take a look at Genshin Impact using the key mapping tool. And if you have it enabled in the Nexus settings, it'll allow you to basically bring this up from the top. And as you can see, I've already mapped all my buttons right here. And for the analog sticks, you have two options. One is to turn it to camera pan mode, and then you can also adjust the sensitivity. And so I've mapped all my buttons, and as you can see here, I've set it to high settings and 60 frames per second. Now the frame counter app that I'm using just didn't play well with Genshin Impact, so it's saying 145 frames per second. But obviously it's going to be 60 frames or less, and to me this feels very good. I would say it's between 50 and 60 right now. And as you can see, the button mapping tool is working like a charm. I would say that the right analog camera movement is not super fluid, but all the same, it's totally playable. And so specifically, if you're looking for a Genshin Impact handheld, yeah, this is going to work out great. And the same can be done for other games like shooters. Here is Call of Duty Mobile. 
And I have the same general layout right here, but I have put the D-pad down here on the bottom. This allows me to switch between my melee weapon and my gun very quickly. Now, the only unfortunate thing about this is that in the current Nexus software, there is no ability to invert the Y-axis on the right analog stick. And for me personally, I play inverted. And so because of that, this is unfortunately unplayable. And I get it. I think a lot of us inverted players are a dying breed at this point, but all the same, it would be really nice just to have that little toggle right there in the settings. And so hopefully that's maybe something that Razer can implement in the future, but as it stands right now, the button mapping works well in Call of Duty, but I will never play it myself. Next up, let's talk about streaming. Here is the PS5 Remote Play app known as PS Play available in the Play Store. And as you can see, this one is working great. Even the analog inputs are inputting correctly. And I'm also getting a very stable connection here in my local Wi-Fi. And so if you want to use this for Remote Play, either from Xbox or PlayStation, I think you're in for a treat. Now, additionally, I can do some game streaming over the cloud. So for example, here I'm using Game Pass to do Xbox cloud streaming. And same thing here, this one works really well. The connection is very nice and solid. And I'm also getting an analog input here with the gas pedal in Forza Horizon 5. And so I think if you're mostly interested in game streaming, especially on an AMOLED display like this, you're gonna have a good time. Now, of course, by virtue of being an Android tablet, there are other Android-y things you could do as well. For example, you could unhook it from the controller and then connect to something like Netflix or Plex and then use this like a small movie machine as well. And that might work out really well. Say you're on travel and you're going on an airplane trip and you want to be able to watch movies and play games and you don't want to have to swap out your devices. This will all work in one. Okay, so that's the overall Android experience when it comes to games and streaming and other apps. Let's now get into my bread and butter, which is retro game emulation. Like I said previously, I don't think that 4x3 content is going to be a very good fit for this aspect ratio, but I did want to demonstrate here real quick that you can play Killer Instinct at full speed using the main core within RetroArch. But from here on out, I want to move up to harder to play systems. We'll start with PlayStation 1 using the Duck Station emulator. Here we can get a 5x resolution or 1080p resolution, absolutely no problem here. And so if you want to play some of your favorite PS1 games with an upscaled resolution, you can totally do that here, no problem. And the same story will happen with the other systems from this generation. So Super Mario 64 and Nintendo 64, absolutely no problem. Same thing with the harder to play Nintendo 64 games like Cruise in USA. These are all upscaled to a 1080p resolution as well. Now for Sega Saturn, I prefer to use the Beetle Saturn core within RetroArch. This one is a very accurate emulator, and so everything's going to look very good. That being said, this core is not capable of upscaling, so we're going to play everything at the native resolution, which I still think looks very good here. Moving on to the next generation, here is Sega Dreamcast. Now this is running with the ReDream emulator, and I've upscaled it to a 1440p resolution. There is a lower resolution you can use, but it's under 1080p, and so I wanted to make sure we're at least hitting the exact pixel resolution that we have on the screen. And so we're doing a bit of super scaling by giving it more resolution than it needs, but all the same, it is playing at full speed. I did get a dip in audio every once in a while with NBA 2K2, one of the hardest Dreamcast games to emulate. And so for this one, you could bump down the resolution to the lower tier if you'd like. Another system that played very well is PlayStation Portable. This one I'm running at a 4X resolution or 1080p to match the display resolution. But in my testing, I was also able to play it at a 6x resolution at full speed as well. However, at that point, I don't think you can really see the difference in resolution at all on the display, and so you're really just going to be running down the battery unnecessarily. One thing I will note as well is that with certain games like Ridge Racer, I found that the D-pad was a very good fit. In fact, in my very first playthrough on the first route, I got one of the fastest times I've ever gotten in this game. And so if you're a big PSP fan like me and you want to be able to play these games at a really nice resolution, this will work out well, and they look especially good on the AMOLED display. Even God of War Chains of Olympus plays at full speed at 1080p. Now I think the next systems are probably the most important when it comes to emulation, so we'll spend a bit of time kind of going through these. Starting with GameCube, I will say that 3x resolution was basically my standard for most games. That also is a 1080p resolution, and the upscale here looks very good. I'm using the standard Dolphin emulator that's available in the Play Store or directly from the Dolphin website. And I've also turned on widescreen hacks to be able to get a 16x9 aspect ratio for most games. And I think the proof is in the pudding here that most of these games will play at 1080p and they'll look really good. And so to give you an idea of just how good GameCube is on this device, we're going to go ahead and start up F-Zero GX. What generally will happen on other systems is that the first 10 seconds of F-Zero GX on that first race will have quite a bit of stutters and then it'll smooth out. But as you can see right here, it is smooth right from the beginning. And to me, that's a good indication that the rest of the game is going to play at full speed as we keep playing. However, I do want to caution you that not every game is going to play perfectly. For example, with Rogue Squadron 2, even at a 720p or 2x resolution, I did experience quite a bit of stutters. 
And so for some games, you may have to try like the MMJR version of Dolphin, or you'll have to adjust the resolution to get the best performance. And as we'll see with the next system, we had a very similar experience. With Nintendo Wii, we also played most games at a 1080p resolution, and many of my favorites like Super Paper Mario and Donkey Kong Country Returns, and even Kirby's Epic Yarn played very well at 1080p. I get a stutter here and there with Kirby, but other than that, everything was very smooth. Now Super Mario Galaxy did play at a 3x resolution, but I did get quite a few dips in the first few minutes. And so I wouldn't say this is a perfect experience at 1080p, and so you may have to drop this down to 720p instead. For other games like Tatsunoko vs. Capcom, even dropping it to a 2x resolution did not give me full speed. For example, when doing a special move like this, I did get quite a bit of slowdown. And so I would say that not every Wii game is going to play perfectly, but many will. Moving over to PlayStation 2, I would say it's actually pretty similar here as well. For many games, I was able to play them at a 1080p or 3x resolution. That includes some lightweight games like Ico, Katamari Damacy, and Virtua Fighter 4. But even some that are a little bit harder to run, something like Final Fantasy XII, still played really well at 1080p. I would get a dip every once in a while, but honestly I found it perfectly acceptable. Now when moving it up to more 3D based games, I did drop a lot of these down to a 720p or a 2x resolution instead. That's going to include games like Jack and Daxter and Black and the second Ratchet and Clank game. And I even found that God of War 2 played at 720p full speed as well. Now bear in mind this is without doing any sort of emulation hacks or any sort of fast preset. This is literally just using the default settings, and so for certain games you may have to mess around with the settings to get better performance. But at the end of the day, I think we're very close to one of my favorite positions when it comes to emulation, when we can just start playing these games right out of the box. Now, like with the other two systems, the PlayStation 2 emulation is not quite perfect for every game. For example, with Sly Cooper, I had to play this one at a native resolution, and I still got quite a bit of slowdown. And so this is one of those games where I would probably have to go in and mess around with the underclocking settings or something else to make sure it runs better. And so while the Razor Edge does have a lot of raw power, sometimes that's not going to be enough. Another one that required some configuration was the Citra app for Nintendo 3DS emulation. Last week when I reviewed the Pimax Portal, I was able to get a 3x resolution for most Citra games. And so naturally, that's what I tried here with the Razor Edge. But I found that most of the 3DS games I tried, including the lightweight ones, had some significant audio stutters and dips in frame rate. And so as an example, I'm going to let some of these play out here real quick. And so for this, what I did is I tried out the MMJ version of Citra instead, again with a 3x resolution, and then everything started working perfectly. And so even the same games that were giving me stutters with the vanilla version were working just fine in MMJ. Now personally, I tend to avoid the MMJ version of Citra when I can because it introduced some compatibility and accuracy issues when it comes to emulation. One of the biggest culprits is Ocarina of Time 3D. Many times when using this emulator, you'll get all sorts of graphical glitches, but as you can see here, it's running just great. In fact, all the 3DS games that I tried with this emulator were perfectly playable and looked very good too. And that's at a 3x resolution. Okay, and finally, the last system I wanted to test for emulation was Nintendo Switch using the Skyline emulator. In many of the lightweight games for Nintendo Switch, those that are very compatible with the Skyline emulator did work well. In fact, I played most of these games in docked mode to get improved graphics and they still played at a very good speed. Now there were some that had some compatibility issues, like a short hike, as you can see here, the ground is just kind of weird looking. And there were also others that did not play at full speed, for example Torchlight 2 and Untitled Goose Game. In fact, because I had quite a few Switch games that consistently would not play at full speed, this is the system that my friend Stubbs and I tested when it came to comparing the 5G and Wi-Fi models of the Razer Edge. And so what we did is we each played the same game with the same version of Skyline and the same settings as well. And with the frame counter on here in the top left, we tried to see if there was any difference between playing the same levels between the two systems. And I'll let you make your own judgments here, but I personally did not see any difference between the two gigabytes in these two models. And so I would say that games like Cuphead played equally poor in terms of frame dips, and then also Super Mario 3D World played around the same speed and also has some significant graphical glitches too. And so in the end, I think when it comes to emulation overall, the performance is just about the same between 6 and 8 gigs of RAM. If anything, I think those additional 2 gigs may help with certain Android games, and it may also help to keep your device feeling fresh and snappy a couple years from now. But at least when it comes to emulation specifically right now, I do not see a $200 difference between the 
there too. And finally, before we move on, I think we should all pay attention right here to just how terrible Stubbs is at Metroid Dread. And I find this kind of funny because I'm pretty terrible at this game too, but at least I know how to melee counter. And truth be told, I'm a little bit scared of this game. Like anytime those robots start chasing me, I just freak out. And so if anything, I'm just very thankful for Stubbs because he gave me a little bit of an ego boost and I think I can play a little bit more of this game. Okay, up next, I wanted to test out the video out capabilities of the Razer Edge. As you can see right here, using an HDMI connector to USB-C, it does not work through the pass-through port. But if you take the tablet out and you connect it directly to the HDMI, then yes, you do get a video signal out. However, one thing to note here is that the output resolution is still 20 by 9, even on a 16 by 9 display. And so the scaling here is not adapting to the output monitor. However, if you're willing to live with those black bars on the top and bottom, you could connect a Bluetooth controller and then use this as a portable console. So for example, here I'm playing PlayStation 2. And then same thing here, playing the Final Fight arcade game through RetroArch. And so yes, it is possible to consoleize the Razer Edge, but all the same, that 20 by 9 aspect ratio kind of drives me nuts. And who knows, maybe some output scaling will be coming in a future software update, but personally, I'm not holding my breath. Okay, and last thing here before we start wrapping up, I did want to mention that I got this recent bag here from TomTalk. And this is originally made for the Nintendo Switch, but as you can see, it fits the Razer Edge really well. It has a front pocket on it, as well as an inside pocket too. Now this inside pocket was originally meant to hold a bunch of Switch cartridges, but you could use it for SD cards or maybe a bag of chips. Either way, I'm going to leave a link to this case in the video description because I've been really enjoying it. Now Stubbs also bought a case that fits the Razer Edge, and this is footage of it right here. And this one's a little bit weird, it feels like it's like nursing gear, it has a stethoscope on the front, I'm not really sure what's going on here. Either way, it is a hard shell and it fits the edge very well too. And I'll share a link to this one too, I think it's around $13. Now mine was about $50, but man, I think mine was way better than his. Anyway, that's enough of poking fun at stubs, let's go ahead and move on to the summary next. And here we're going to talk about what I like and what I don't like about the Razer Edge. Number one, I think this is a pretty good price at $400 for the amount of features and power that you're getting. If you wanted to piecemeal a similar phone into a controller like this, you would probably pay twice the price. And so in terms of comparative value between a phone and a Kishi controller and the Razer Edge itself, I think you're getting a better deal here. I also really like the quality of the display overall. I like the fact that it went from very dim to very bright, and the richness and saturation of the colors was very nice too. And I would say the battery life here is pretty impressive. I got between 6 and 10 hours between each charge, and I would say that 8 hours is my expected average here. I also think this is a pretty nice controller. It has some pretty good ergonomics, and the triggers feel really nice too. Additionally, I really like the soft touch of the face buttons. In terms of overall Android and emulation performance, I also think this was very good. After all, I was able to play just about every Android game at max settings, and I was also able to upscale most emulated systems to 1080p as well. And for me, that's just about perfect when it comes to emulation on an Android device. I also really appreciated the audio quality. I wasn't expecting much because the speakers are facing outward, but I found that the sound bounces up through the controller itself and sounds really good. I also didn't have a very good way to demonstrate this, but I like the new haptics that they're using on this new version of the Razer Kishi. The overall rumble effect just feels a lot more premium, but I will say that it was a little bit stronger than I would have liked. And unfortunately, there's nothing in the software that allows you to turn down those haptics. And finally, I think this is a bit of an understated feature, but I like the fact that the Razer Edge is readily available. You could order it right now from Amazon or from Razer's website, or if you live near one of the Razer stores, you can just pick it up right then. And the same thing cannot be said for most other gaming handhelds. And so I do appreciate the fact that if you are thinking about buying one of these, you could just buy it today. Now, of course, this device has quite a few issues, and so let's talk about these next. Number one, I think I've made it very clear that I'm not a fan of the 20 by 9 aspect ratio. I feel like if we had a 16 by 9 display right here, I would like this device about twice as much as I do now. As it stands right now, I don't intend on playing any 4x3 content on this device at all. And I think that speaks volumes about a $400 device. If there's something like that that's a concession that you just won't play certain games, then for me that's kind of a deal-breaking feature. Now I understand that a lot of people are not going to feel the same way as me about aspect ratio, but still, that's a lot of wasted space for a 4x3 system. And given the fact that two of the major emulation highlights on this device, which are PS2 and GameCube, those played at a native 4x3 aspect ratio. And so unless the game has widescreen hacks and cheats, then you're going to have to play it at a much smaller size than you'd like. I also got the overall impression that the software is just left unfinished. For example, under the Razer Edge product page, under the FAQ, there are multiple things there where they say that something's coming in a future software update. And so as it stands right now, there are quite a few things that I don't like about the software. 
Number one, the SD card file system is FAT32, which means you can't put any games that are larger than four gigabytes on the card. Additionally, there is no way to invert the right analog stick within the button mapping tool. And while the device does have display out, it outputs to a 20 by nine aspect ratio, which just looks terrible on a 16 by nine display. And finally, I feel like the haptics are a little bit too powerful. And unfortunately, there's no way to adjust that within the software. And so we have quite a few things related to the software that just hold this device back from being stellar. Additionally, another thing I don't really like about the Razer Edge is the fact that it kind of feels a little bit cobbled together. And by that I mean the fact that this is essentially just a tablet with a Razer Kishi controller attachment. This same controller has been available since last year, and obviously you can attach it to any other phone. And unfortunately, I don't see a lot of distinct differences between the Razer Edge itself and just using a phone in a Kishi version 2. And finally, I think the last two points here are probably going to be my biggest. Number one, this is a $400 device that is running on Android. And while it can play just about anything that Android can play, we're still kind of limited by what Android can do in the first place. Now we have gotten some recent additions, for example, a PS Vita emulator, which works pretty well for being in a beta state right now, but still there are many systems that just cannot be played on Android. For me personally, I would love to see Nintendo Wii U emulation because I think that would be brilliant on here. And other systems like Nintendo Switch still have a long ways to go when it comes to development. And so yes, this thing is a beast when it comes to Android. The thing is that Android gaming itself is not that much of a beast compared to other things you can get at that same price point. Which, spoiler alert, is the next section we're going to talk about, and that is literally, who is this device actually for? Because again, I think we need to talk about this device in the context of the $400 you would spend to get it. And I think personally, at this price point, you're not going to be buying multiple devices at $400. What you're probably thinking is I have a budget of $400 and I want to buy the one that's the best fit for me. And when looking at the other things you can do with your money at that same price point, I feel like there are other options we should consider. Like I mentioned in the intro of the video, the base model of the Steam Deck is also $400. And so let's do a quick comparison between the two using a Venn diagram because I haven't used one in a while. When it comes to the things that overlap between these two, they both start at $400 and they can emulate games. Now the Razer Edge can also play Android games and can get some pretty good battery life between six and 10 hours. And it's relatively portable as a gaming solution. You could throw this into a bag and it wouldn't take up much space. Now by comparison, the Steam Deck cannot play Android games. However, it can play thousands and thousands of different PC games and then also has desktop class emulation. And so all those emulators I'd love to have on Android are already available on the Steam Deck. I can play things like Wii U and PS3 and Xbox on the Steam Deck when that's not even an option on the Razer. Now, of course, there's always a give and take with everything. And so, for example, the Steam Deck has worse battery life. I would expect between two and six hours of battery, depending on what you're playing. However, the 16 by 10 aspect ratio is going to work out much better when it comes to emulation. And so honestly, when I start to think about the $400 price of the Razer Edge, yeah, it's a good deal in terms of competition against a phone and a controller. But if we're just talking about competition for your $400, I would pick the Steam Deck over this one any day. You're going to have a more seamless user interface overall that's specifically made for gaming, and you're going to be able to play way more games on SteamOS than an Android platform. Now, of course, I'm making some assumptions, like the fact that you don't mind having a big Steam Deck and it's also available in your region. All the same, if I just had no gaming device at all, but $400 to spend, I would not be buying the Razer Edge, I would be buying the Steam Deck. And so in the end, it's very hard to articulate who exactly the Razer Edge is for. If you're an Android gamer and you don't want to take your phone out of its case and hook it up to a Razer Kishi controller, then yes, I could see there being a case for actually using the Razer Edge. I'm just not sure if that minor inconvenience of taking your phone out of a case is going to be worth $400 to you. Because again, if I had $400 to spend on a gaming device and I wasn't going to buy the Steam Deck, I'm still not sure I would buy the Razer Edge. As a quick example, here is the LG V60. I bought this for about $225 last year, but you can now find it for about $160 on eBay. Now this phone uses a Snapdragon 865 and does not have active cooling, so the performance is not gonna be as close as it is on the Razer Edge. But all the same, it pairs very well with the version two of the Razer Kishi right here. Now this one lacks a headphone jack and also doesn't have those nice haptics. And even hooking these up together, you will get a little bit more wobble. But all the same, for a much cheaper price, I'm able to get something that's very similar to the Razer Edge. Here on eBay, I can pick up the V60 for $160, and then I can grab Razer's Kishi here for $95. So I can save myself about $140 and still play most of the systems that I want to play. And so if $400 is a little bit too rich for your blood and you don't mind taking that ding in performance, you could always do something like this just like you could last year or the year before. Similarly, if you wanted to go an even cheaper route for Android gaming, I would recommend something like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. 
This one will set you back $150 plus shipping, but this one's quite a bit smaller and more pocketable, but it also feels a lot sturdier by virtue of being just a single handheld device. Additionally, it has that 16 by 9 aspect ratio, which is going to work well for many different gaming systems. And so for less than half the price of the Razer Edge, you can get a gaming system that's really not that bad at all. In the end, I think it comes down to how much you value raw power in a handheld. If you're looking for one of the most powerful Android devices available and $400 is about right for you, then yeah, I could see the Razer Edge being a viable option. But I think for everybody else, I don't think there's enough unique factors to the Razer Edge to warrant my recommendation. If anything, I would say if this device came out last year and before the Steam Deck, it would have been a no-brainer. But here in 2023, I feel like they've lost their audience. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Is this the right device for you or is it too little too late? As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.